Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Um, super excited to have truly one of my favorite guests. He kept trying to get away last time, and I kept kept him here, but we have a hard out on this one, so he, he's going to be able to make an escape. It's Brett Devereaux. Um, he is, in many ways, if you had took me when I was 16 years old during the golden age of science fiction and fantasy and said, you can have an academic career that looks like this and you showed me his stuff that's what i would want to do <laughs> um, and he he he's done yeoman work on the warfare of middle earth and other and game of thrones and all that but he's also a respected um historian of ancient and military he's an ancient and military historian who currently teaches at the as a teaching assistant professor at North Carolina State University, he has a PhD in ancient history from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and um, we're having him here to talk about a bunch of different things. I want to start by saying welcome back to the Remnant. Great to be back. And two, um, there was this brouhaha not too long ago about it went viral on 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 TikTok and other places about how men, a surprisingly large number of men spend a surprisingly large amount of time thinking about ancient Rome. And my uh, colleague, Chris Darwalt, when he substituted for me, he had Mike Duncan on here and he set up this whole conversation and then he never asked Duncan why uh, he thought that was the case. So I, bef I don't want to make the same mistake after I dinged Chris for that. <laughs> Do you have a theory about why young men or men think so disproportionately about ancient Rome? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think I, I think I have a few. Um, I, I'm I'm prepared to be budget Mike Duncan. That's that's OK. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, when that meme came out, uh, I thought, well, yeah, I mean, I think about ancient Rome daily. Yeah, you don't um, count. I apparently. Yes. No, this is what I am told that I don't yeah. count. No. Um, so I, I think mean, about I think, dogs a lot. OK, I mean, it's just a different thing. <laughs> it's fair. Um, so. I think a lot of this has to do with the place that Rome has in in our culture. That there's a, a sort of a general public understanding that like Rome is one of those important historical moments that is worth thinking about and is valuable to think about. You know, we make movies about them. They get prestige HBO series and so on. Um, and so it, it feels important. And to be frank, it it is important. Um, the Romans cast a pretty long historical shadow. I mean, we... In the United States, our form of government is a sort of per, per effort at perfecting the Roman Republic. There's a lot of influence of Roman political philosophy. The world's largest religion had its genesis within the Roman Empire, um, which seems terribly important. And, you know, most most of the literature in your European languages are built on a foundation of Latin literature. And so, like there is something real to this concept that hey Rome is a little more important maybe to think about than than sort of a, a society in the past picked at random. Um, though I think all past societies are are worth noodling at least a little, um, and so I think that 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 impacts a sort of well if you're going to think about something you know this is very present in the zeitgeist and then i think the other factor is that rome has also become in american discourse a flashpoint for discussion about american success and american decline and so i think sort of right thinking about rome is often directly connected to those anxieties is china rising is the united states falling you know is our society coming apart is our democracy coming apart um and so i i suspect that 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 contributes as as, as well um the only issue the big issue i had with the tiktok is that it was you know is explicitly men um thinking about ancient rome i know a lot of women that think about ancient rome regularly too um, I don't know that it is quite as as strongly gendered as the as the joke implies. Perhaps it is, but I don't. So know that it is. I, again, I'm I'm gonna uh, suggest that that has something to do with the selection bias um, <laughs> <laughs> of the life you live. Um, A touch, yeah. I mean, uh, I I bring it up all the time, but like you know, Richard Nixon was once asked if he believed the overpopulation was a problem, and he said. Of course I do. I mean, everywhere I go, I see huge crowds. <laughs> and, that's because you're president of the United States. Um, uh, on the male thing, because I was going to ask you that before you even brought it up. Um, 
I do think that part of the male, exp- I'm curious what you think about this. Part of the male, uh, the part of the explanation for the male part of it is that rightly or wrongly confused, filtered through pop culture, all that kind of stuff. There is this sense among a certain subset of American men that in Rome, the constraints on your manly side were sufficiently less and that the alignment of notions of honor and ignitas or whatever and masculine impulses and desires was closer to that of what a 12 year old boy would want them to be or a 14 year old, right? It was like, like it's the part of me that still likes to watch Spartacus, the, the stars TV series is because I know that it's a very cartoonish version of ancient Rome in the way that the 300 was a cartoonish version of ancient Greece or whatever, but that purient kind of men were men and, and all the women were really attractive. And, um, I think that, that plays into part of it as well no maybe yeah no i think i think it does and there's often a a sort of filter that goes on with this where you get folks who are imagining what they would be like as a roman general or a roman senator and i'm always hearing like yeah but you wouldn't be those things you would be some poor roman peasant um or some you know roman slave right i mean these are and so you know a uh, part of this is, yeah, there's a sort of fantasy of of power. Rome was a, a very hierarchical, very unequal society, much more so than we are. Um, you know, the the Roman elite were fantastically wealthy, and you know, ninety odd percent of the population lived in what we would consider desperate poverty. Um, and so, I think there's a sort of there's a fantasy of of being on the top of that very pointy pyramid um, to which as the historian, I just have to direct your eyes to the, the bottom of the pyramid that like, this wasn't, this wasn't actually like the greatest system to live in. It achieved some spectacular things. Um, I think the, the sort of, you do get this kind of like, Oh yeah, Rome is where, where men were men kind of thing, which I actually think is kind of, is kind of funny that it gets directed at Rome I mean, in terms of legal regime, Rome was probably the most liberal society for women in the ancient Mediterranean. Um, you know, Roman women could own property. They could sue in court. Um, there were a number of ways for them to end up as legally independent. Our our male Roman authors complain about this. Um, the, the satirists are are full of complaints about you know, wealthy Roman women who, because they own all the property in the relationship, can control their husbands. And obviously that bothers them deeply. And um, and so it is, it's kind of funny to see that sort of projected. Similarly, there's this sort of sense of like the Romans were, you know, all like super buff, gigantic guys, which is certainly not how like the Romans are like, man, those Gauls and Germans are big. Um, you know, they've, they've just hair everywhere. I mean, what's going on? Um, and, and the Romans we actually have could be a touch bookish. Um, you know, like Roman elites are invariably bilingual in Greek and Latin and familiar with the literature of both. Um, it, you know, um, uh, Scipio Emilianus was asked as he stepped off a boat, um, what he thought about the actually murder of one of his political allies. And he responds on the spot with a Greek quotation from Homer. Like this is the kind of society that's, that's going on. And um, um, Cicero in his letters regularly shifts between Latin and Greek. Um, he shifts into Greek when he wants to make sure that the postman won't read it. <laughs> um, but that tells you something about him and about the people he's writing to. And so this sort of like, oh, these are all super tough guys. And it's like, well, eh. yeah, um, um, we're going to get to the the meteor stuff that I wanted to have you on here for. But um, just a question on that, because it just it occurs to me. You ever see you watch Deadwood? No, I have not. Oh, it's, you really should. Uh, Clearly. Yeah. Um, and one of the things they don't quite speak in iambic pentameter. But it's close at times, and it's 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 because and they explained you know the the makers of the show explained that basically the only thing people had read was like the King James Bible and a bunch of quotations from Shakespeare and a few other things that happened to be in these like school almanac kind of things, and so they weren't literate, 
but the stuff that fueled their the lingua franca was much seems literate to us because instead of pop culture references to the Simpsons, it's to Chaucer, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't mean they actually grasped Chaucer or anything like that. I'm wondering, was uh, the, the, the Homer, you know, the quoting ancient poets uh, who are ancient to us, but not so ancient to them. Is that part of it? Is that, that, that this is sort of part of just the lingua franca is that the literary stuff seeps in. And so it makes them seem maybe at times, I mean, Cicero was clearly learned, but like were some of them, you know, just sort of this, these were the shibboleths of the day is to, to quote this stuff. Yeah, no, there's certainly an element of that. And, and we get sort of windows in our sources, right? I mean, the other thing of, of course, about the classical corpus is that, uh, you know, with, with a few exceptions, right? Like the bad authors just don't survive. Nobody copied those. Right. This stuff had to be copied by hand for centuries to reach us. And so, um, you know, you know, Cicero and Caesar and Homer and Demosthenes make it. And the oh, I, I can't remember what speech of Cicero's it is where he just spends a whole paragraph making fun of a third rate poet in Rome. But like that guy's poetry does not survive. Um and so, you, you know, you certainly had that and you, you certainly had your your sort of your blockheads. Um, and you also had learned men pretending to be blockheads for the sake of politics. Um, Cato the Elder was kind of famous for doing this, that, um, you know, he's like, I don't read any of that Greek. And then you're like, yeah, you do. <laughs> um, uh, but um, but there was there was certainly a range. Um, I think there's also the fact, the sort of training that a Roman elite has, um, that after you sort of went through the basics of of grammar and learning to read and, and basic math, the Roman equivalent of a sort of higher education was training in rhetoric. And so your sort of average Roman aristocrat is formally trained in rhetoric. Um, and so that literary sense tends to be quite refined. Um, but yeah, I think to a degree, right? I mean, they are using Homer and later for Latin Virgil. It's like these are the texts you use to understand the language yeah. in the first yeah. place. And so, you know, that's maybe a little more elevated than, than C-Spot Run. Um, but it, it fills a similar similar position. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Okay. So one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on sooner rather than later again um, is uh, we're my magnetic personality. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, we're recording this on December six, and um, we've now we are now one day away from the two month anniversary of the Hamas attack on Israel, um, and one of the endless arguments is 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 essentially a who 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 started it kind of thing right and um and the claims and counterclaims of israel is a settler colonial power and these are all european jews and the counterclaims that well actually most of the jews there come from the um from the region because they were expelled from these countries that they had lived in this region for thousands of years and blah 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 blah, blah and you go back and forth Palestine. See, it was always the left, the the pro Hamas people. I want to be careful about terms here. The the Hamas defenders or or minimizers will say stuff like Palestine. Of course, the Palestinians belong here because this place has been called Palestine forever, and therefore the Palestinians are the ones who have been there were there first. And then people like me will say, well, actually, Palestine is this kind of like name that the Romans give it to sort of screw the Jews and blah 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 blah. So we figured, let's just. Start from the beginning. Uh, <laughs> what is like if you have students who ask you about this question in a good faith, non tendentious kind of way, and they just want to know like what you think of the historical claims to the land, Jews, Palestinians, the Ottoman Empire, like what is your your run through? And I, you can take as long or as little as you like on it. So, yeah. So the first thing that I would I would tell that student and that I'll, I'll tell the audience is just a reminder that there is this sort of um, 
there's this sort of trope in, in in American discussions of this that like, oh, this conflict has been going for centuries. And it has not. It has been running for 75 years. This is a post-World War II conflict. It does not have deeper roots. Um, you know, it was created by the way that the British mandate in Palestine was dissolved. And um and I think that's important both because like, yeah, we can talk about what this land was called in 1200 BC. And, you know, I have that. We can do that. Um, but on some fundamental level, like that's just not really relevant. And especially it's not relevant like for this conflict, because most of the people involved in this conflict were not around 75 years ago when it started. They were all born in this place. And at some point, you know, every as a historian, you realize like every scrap of land on the planet Earth is stolen. Um, there is there is no dirt you can find anywhere that somebody hasn't stolen from somebody else at some point. Like at some stage, we must all learn to get along with our neighbors and and you know interact with fairness and justice. And if if we were fighting about stolen land, we'd be fighting forever and ever. Um, it would never end. Um, so with that caveat, um, both the terms Israel and Palestine are extremely old in their original forms. Um, generally speaking, scholars figure that the earliest we can see the attestation of the word Israel is on, um, I'm going to mispronounce this, but the Minerpta, um, Steely, which is circa 1200 BC in Egypt, where the um, the Steely is celebrating the Pharaoh's great victories in warfare in the Levant in this region. And it lists Israel as one of the places that has been subdued and conquered and, and wrecked. Um, okay, you should explain what a Steely is just in case. Oh, a Steely is a, is a, uh, a big smooth carved stone that we have put an inscription on. Yeah, sorry, yeah. that's a good point. Um, and um, and this is a fairly standard kind of royal Egyptian propaganda thing. Look at all of the people that I'm defeating um, all by myself. And but it, it names what looks to be Israel now with, with hieroglyphs. The the interpretation of going from characters to pronunciation to the word is mm -hmm. tricky. But I think there is widespread agreement among scholars that that this is probably Israel. Um, because the hieroglyph had a guy eating a bagel, right? And so that's that's how they know. <laughs> <laughs> it is spelled out phonetically, okay. um, which you can do with hieroglyphs. I did not know uh, that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the word Israel is attested even earlier in um, in texts from the Levant, particularly from the northern Levant, um, which is which is where the the Phoenicians are. We'll talk about them in a second. Um, as a given name which makes a lot of sense given that, I mean, if you know your scripture, right, like the name of the country gets there because this is the name Jacob takes. And so like, it, it is actually a name that people would have. Um, but it seems like by 1200, it's the name of the country. Um, Palestine, though it has a windier route to that pronunciation is almost as old. Um, Egyptian inscriptions beginning in the 1100s refer to a people as the Peleset. Um, and that seems to be what in scripture would be the Philistines um, that they're referring to. Um, and then as we get into the early Iron Age, there's some very similar terminology used by the Assyrians in their royal documents to refer to people in this region by a similar sort of name. And so we think that is the name that is bouncing around that gets picked up by Herodotus, a Greek writing in the fifth century, who refers to the region as Palestine, Palestine. Um, and that becomes the Greek geographic term for the region, um, sort of through that route. So both of these terms are, are old. I mean, uh, it, it really does get to the point where like, I look at this because people ask me, like, obviously I have this whole spiel ready. Um, like I have been asked this question, like at some point, I think they're looking for an insight about this conflict. And I'm not sure that, that words written in stone in 1200 BC are, are necessarily, uh, you know, gonna, gonna bring peace to the Middle East. Um, but it, it is useful to note that like, these are both very, very old and, my cat decided to to enter the podcast, but that's okay. 
Um, these are these these words are both very very old. There have been a lot of different peoples living in this place, um, including the Israelites, but including lots of people who were not Israelites for a really long time. Um, and it has not been one long story of violence, but rather periods of peace and periods of contestation, as you would get anywhere else. This is a a perhaps a a more tense part of the world generally than most, less because of who lives in it and more because it sits on the crossroads between empires. Um, it's often been the, the border space between competing imperial powers that has created a lot of violence. But, um, but you know, the place itself is not, uh, they haven't been fighting there forever. Well, so also, I mean, if I, if I heard you right, so Israel refers to essentially a people nation gets complicated. What's a nation, right? But like the nation of Israel referred to a people in the same way that like there's a Curtis nation. They just got screwed out of a country. Right. And, um, did Palestine refer to a nation in that way? Or was it more of a sort of like Levant referring to a, a geographic space more than a, peopled space. If so that makes sense. in those earliest Egyptian and, um, and Assyrian inscriptions, it seems to be referring to a people um, again, kind of these Philistines, by the time it makes it into Greece, it is a geographic signifier. The Greeks don't know that it means a people. Um, and there is some plasticity with, with these terms. Um, you get similar difficulties with, with Canaan and Canaanites. Um, the sort of the, the root of Canaan seems to mean something like lowlander. Um, and, and we get it used as what seems to be a geographical descriptor relatively early as we get into the iron age, 600s, 500s, we find the peoples who live in the Northern coastal Levant, which today would be Lebanon using a, a variation of, of, of the word Canaan to describe themselves um, and sort of like, okay, we have some people who are self-described Canaanites. Now, this is a lot later. Um, we don't generally call them that. We call them by what the Greeks called them, which is Phoenicians. Um, these are the great sea traders of the Mediterranean. Um, and so you get a lot of a lot of word drift. Um, there definitely would have been, as a side note, in within the modern geographic borders of of Israel, right? You would have had in this early point. Um, both your sort of your Hebrews, your your Israelites, the sort of ancestors, uh, but also yeah, Phoenicians, Philistines, Moabites, Elamites, all sorts of other groups, um, you know, who have demonyms and 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 so on. It's it's a complex region, as, as we can see it clearly. I should note, I should note in terms of our ability to uh, view this region historically, we really only can see it clearly very well as we're getting into the early Iron Age, 900, 800 BC. Um, before that, right, we have scattered, like, it's a big deal that there's one Egyptian inscription that mentions them, right? Yeah, you're okay, sort right. of, you're not, you don't have a lot to work with. So, but one of the points you'll often hear is that Palestine, that the quote unquote Palestinians, and I know this is getting you a little bit out of the ancient stuff, but, uh, that the Palestinians have a country. It's called Jordan because the area that was Palestine included a lot more area than what is currently Israel. And the, it's the Arabs who were left in the part that is Israel or Israel adjacent in terms of the occupied territories that have now agglomerated into themselves, the name Palestinian. But really, if you're talking about Arabs from the region, there, there are a couple countries that have, you know, that are quote unquote geographically Palestinian that have their own country is, do you think that's fair? Do you think it's a distortion? So exactly. Uh, let me back up. This is a region where the history of, of states trying to make borders work in a mm -hmm. sort of complex demographic situation um, is, is long, you know, and this is true of, of so many, countries around the globe, I think it's important for folks to recognize 
we often imagine that the nation state is like the standard form that humans come in. It's not. Nation states are created. They're usually created with violence. Um, it's not a great a great process. Um, I, I've always argued the United States rejects the nation state as a model, right? I mean, we have no myth of common ancestry. We have a myth of not common ancestry. Um, and I think that's good. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a region where both local states and empires have been trying to sort of enforce boundaries on people for a long time. I think the the fact of the matter is like, if we go back to partition in, in 1948, right, there were Arab Palestinians and what were soon to be Israeli, both Jews and Muslims, <laughs> right, um, living in the region um, generally mixed up, right, like broadly jumbled. Um, 75 years of violence has caused a lot of sorting, though the sorting is, of course, not perfect. There are Israeli Arab Muslims, like that's a population that exists. Um, so the sorting is by no means by no means perfect. But what you started with is 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 a jumble. And so I think to say, you know, well, these people should have just moved to that country over there. Um, I mean, nobody likes to leave their home. Yeah, no, I get um, that. I get that. Um, I was just looking at more in terms of the historical notion where the it's 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 just the it's just the Arabs who are left in the without a home that call get called essentially the Palestinians to a certain extent. And when in fact the Palestinian, the universe of people descended from that region, lots of them have lived in other countries for a very long time. I'm not trying to make it a, an argument one way or the other about this. I just think it's it gets confusing where you just talk the you talk about the remnant of the displaced. And I, I have a problem. I don't want to get into an argument with you about contemporary UN things or anything, but like the Palestinians are basically the only people in the world who were born into refugee status for generation after generation. Like I, I know a huge number of people who are the descendants of refugees. And at some point, as you were saying earlier about all the stolen land stuff, we're all just like, we're all descended from poor people. We're all descended from refugees at some level of extrapolation, right? Um, but there's a vested institutional interest in keeping this stuff alive that um, I think doesn't get fully appreciated. But I want to get back to the, the ancient part. Um, I could swear that part of the reason why the area got called Palestine instead of, I guess, Judea um was because rome was sick of the hebrews uprising yes and and they kind of just decided to to troll the hebrews by changing the name of their region is that right and what's uh, the story there yeah so um i'm trying to think of how far i have to back up <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the short version is yes so at some point at or after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132, the Romans changed the name of the province. Um, that um, the the Roman name of the province had been officially before then Judea or Judea, as we would say in English. Um, we don't know exactly when the name change happens, but we it's generally been assumed that it happens with this. Um, 132 to 134, this crushing of the second major revolt in the region by Hadrian. Um, Hadrian also fundamentally alters the demographics of the region when he does this. Um, it's it's pretty clear that the prior to this, the the largest demographic group in in the in the region in in the province of Judea were Jews. Um, that's why they. They called it that, right? I mean, this is, I mean, it had actually been called versions of that earlier. When the Babylonians rule this place, they call it the province of Yehud, um, which, you know, if I'm not a Hebrew speaker, but I am told that folks who know their Hebrew will recognize this word, um, right? Which is just, it's that's Judah in, in Hebrew. Um, so the Romans are continuing that um, sort of, of local naming. Um, and and right to call the place Udaya is like this is the land of the Jews like that's what that means, 
Um, there's um, the first major revolt is in 66. Um, the Romans crack down, they destroy the temple, but they leave the population in place. Then the second revolt comes in 132. And at this point, the Romans have had it. Um, Jerusalem is leveled um, and refounded as a Roman colony. And then um, the most of the population is, is deported to other parts of, of the Roman Empire. And this is one of those cases um, because there are three points at which the, the uh, Israelite stroke Hebrew stroke Jewish population uh, terminology gets sticky about how early can you call these folks Jewish. Um, but there are three points at which that population is, is supposed to be deported. Um, you know, the Assyrians destroy the Northern kingdom of Israel and deport a significant chunk of the population in 720, but it's probably only the elites. The Babylonians destroy the Southern kingdom of Judah in 586 and deport probably only the elites. By contrast, we have a lot of evidence to suggest that the Roman um, effort here is far more to the root, um, that there certainly remain Jewish communities in, in, the, in the region, particularly in Galilee, um, but around Jerusalem, the Romans seem to have moved the whole population and then replaced them with veteran soldiers and other settlers. Um, and so the, the Jewish population in the region shrinks dramatically as a result of, result of this. And then shortly thereafter, we start to see in our sources that it's being referred to as Syria-Palestina. Um, though some of our authors keep calling it Judea, even though there are almost no Jews in it uh, anymore. Um, and so, yeah, this is a major thing. And of course, Hadrian also, when he refounds Jerusalem, he changes the name to Ilia Capitolina. Ilius was essentially his middle name, so he's naming it after himself, because why not? Um, and so, yeah, this is an event um, that takes place and is part of the reason why the, the Jewish population in the region, it, there remains a continuous Jewish population in the region all the way to the modern period, but it's much smaller until the foundation of the modern state of Israel, really until the sort of kind of Zionist movement begins building up a population in order to create the foundation of the state of Israel. But right, like that's how you go from a region that was probably majority Jewish to a region that has a small Jewish minority. You know, there's a certain amount of Jewish pride and, and also because it's Jewish, a certain amount of Jewish remorse about how uppity the Jews in Roman times were, um, you know, and it's sort of like, yeah, we, we stood up for ourselves. Yeah, it didn't work out too well for us. You know, it's, it's a bittersweet kind of thing. Um, where did the Judean people, the Israelites, however, we're going to the, the, the Hebrews, um, how, on the ranking of obstreperous, revolting, subjugated people in the Roman Empire, where did they rank? I mean, did they revolt oh, pretty more? High. Yeah, pretty pretty high. Um, revolts against Roman rule were generally fairly rare, um, in part because as long as you paid taxes, the Romans usually left you alone. Um, Judea was probably the most restive Roman province. And to be fair, it was a complex and, and difficult place. Um, so the way that the Romans end up in control of Judea is as a result of the collapse of the Seleucid Empire. Um, this is one of, right, Al when Alexander the Great conquers the Persian Empire and then dies, and then his generals fight each other over it. Um, the biggest chunk goes to Seleucus and his descendants, Seleucus Nicator. This becomes the Seleucid Empire. And that included what the Greeks at the time called Syria Quele, greater Syria. Technically, the word means hollow Syria, um, which has to do with where the mountains are. Um, but that would be what today would be Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, Jordan. That whole stretch, one big province. Um the Seleucid Empire, as we get into the second century, begins to fall apart in part because they get drubbed by the Romans in the 190s. Um, and the Romans then start interfering with their politics um, to cause succession disputes because they're Romans. Um, and as the Seleucid Empire weakens, of course, um, right, you have this predominantly Jewish population organized around Jerusalem. 
um, that was returned there by Cyrus the Great, the first Persian great king. Um, right, that's when the second temple is built. Um, they revolt in 167. This is the Maccabean revolt. It's successful. They found a kingdom. This is the Hasmonean kingdom. Um, and they exist as an independent state, sometimes a satellite of what's left of the Seleucids, sometimes fully independent. Um, the Romans roll through in the 60s, um, abolish what's left of the Seleucid Empire, make a province in Syria, and more firmly are like, this kingdom is, we have our thumb on you. Um, the... Um, uh, the Romans will decide to switch who is king in 37 because the Hasmoneans could never, they're always fighting each other. And so the Romans pick a third guy, Herod the Great, um, and put him in charge as sort of a Roman client state. Um, Herod then makes the catastrophic mistake of picking the wrong side in a Roman civil war. Um, he, bar he backs Mark Antony um, instead of Octavian. And so from that point, sort of the independence of this kingdom begins declining. Um, Herod's heirs fail to handle a major revolt in 4 BC. And this is the point at which the Romans are like, okay, clearly you need some help. And so they install a governor. Um, and the first of these governors is installed in six. Technically at this point, Judea is a region, but not a province. Um, it's a satellite annex of the province of Syria, but this is why. So you have a governor, you still have the Herodian kings, and then, of course, there are the religious courts, the Sanhedrin headed out of the temple, which leads to the sort of really complicated political geography of this space. This is a difficult area to rule. It's complex. There are lots of people. Um, there are in this period multiple different competing sects of Judaism in the region, um, and for that matter, Second Temple Judaism isn't the only Judaism game in town. You also have um, the uh, a, a different strain of Judaism in Samaria organized around different holy sites, which is probably a leftover of the religion of the Northern Kingdom, right? The Kingdom of Israel, um, as opposed to the Kingdom of Judah, right? This is why everybody is is in the New Testament is side eyeing the Samaritans because like they're the wrong kind of Jew. Mm -hmm. um so it's it's a complex and difficult region that side eye exists today i just want to tell you it's it's a little less intense but <laughs> no just different being jewish wrong is a big thing on jews oh of course well yeah, yeah yeah and and then among your sort of temple judaisms um our sources comment on three on four different sort of alignments that are bouncing around um in the region that are all mad at each other um, you have, um, in the politics you have, so there are what are referred to as the Sadducees. Um, there, there's a theological difference between them and the rest about, about the implications on the afterlife, but the upshot politically is that the Sadducees are much more willing to Hellenize, to adopt Greek cultural markers. And that upsets everybody else, um, right, as you might imagine, this sort of fiercely independent little statelet. And then you've got these elites that are are taking Greek names. Right. Um, this is sort of the background of Hanukkah in a lot yes, of ways. Yeah. Yes. And um, by the Roman time, the Sadducees are pretty well represented in the royal government. So they have a lot of power and wealth. Opposite them are the Pharisees. Um, this is, uh, we might almost describe as a religious fundamentalist movement. They are the teachers of the law, um, and they are arguing for strict observance of Jewish cultural norms and laws. Um, they are much stronger in the sort of temple uh, organization. Um, and because they're arguing for strict observance, right, they are forever at odds with the first group. Um, who are like, maybe we can do Greek things. And it's like, well, Greek things are not in strict observance. <laughs> um, in many cases, they're expressly prohibited. Um, and then beneath these two groups, you have, um, which are the sort of the two respectable groups, you have the zealots who are like, this, these Roman interlopers need to go. We need to do the Maccabean revolt again and get these guys out. And of course, they have a tradition of successful resistance against imperial authority to draw on. 
And, you know, in the early first century, um, you know, they'd like a general uprising. In the meantime, terroristic violence is go. Um, the Romans refer to these guys sometimes as Sicarii, dagger men, because of their habit of knifing people in the streets. Sometimes Romans, but more often, um, right, local uh, Jewish elites that are seen as excessively cooperating with the right. Roman authorities. Collaborators. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, um, and then the last group, um, are the Essenes who look at all of this nonsense and are like, I'm out. We're going to go into the desert, observe religious law very carefully and be sort of inwardly holy. Um, it's often quite shocking to students that I'm like, if you would ask someone in the period to place Jesus in all of this, like he's just obviously an ascetic faith healer. Like that is very clearly where he slots. Um, obviously his theology is going to be different, but, but they would not be hard for people to, to place him. So this is a very complicated political environment. It's very restive. And then on top of this, you have to layer Roman authorities who are just club footed in all of this, just completely thumbless grasp of all of it. The Romans, um, did not have a professional civil service. Um, Roman governors did not feel the need to learn the languages, customs, or cultures of the places they governed. Um, that just wasn't how they rolled. You knew Latin and you knew Greek. And if the locals could speak one of those languages, great. If not, you would start hitting them with swords until they learned one of them. Um, the Roman governor, in, bef uh, up until the revolt in 66, the Roman governor here is not a senator, but a, a praetorian prefect, a lower-ranked Roman official. He's technically subordinate to the real Roman governor in Syria. Um, this is, you know, Pilate, I think. Pontius Pilate is the one that people will know. Um, and his job is to keep a lid on things, but he has no particular training. And it's pretty clear that the Roman governors that move through here, they do not understand Judaism. It is a very, it's a very alien religion to them. The Romans are polytheists and almost every religion in the Roman empire is polytheist. This is the one true monotheism the Romans interact with. And so, like, Roman authorities are stumbling. They're like, why can't we put a statue of the emperor in your temple? Like, mm -hmm. nobody else would mind. Right. Um, but obviously. <laughs> it's, it's a problem for the It's Jews. a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the Romans are forever giving offense. Their efforts to intervene in the local politics aren't good. They're also struggling with the descendants of, of Herod the Great, who they kind of parcel up the region and the, like, we, we can't manage these people. You manage these people. They, they don't draw well in terms of leadership there either. Herod's descendants are mostly clueless. Um, I mean, Herod was brutal but effective at control. His descendants, not so much. Um, and so the Romans really struggle to control this, this province. Um, like I said, forever giving offense. Um, and that combined with complicated politics, combined with a sort of very active memory and commemoration of successful resistance to another imperial power lead to a series of revolts. And the two big ones are in, are in 66 and 132, but those are hardly the only, um, you know, the only flare ups, um, you know, Pilate for his part gets sacked out of his job because a couple years after the crucifixion, um, he badly botches the response to a, a religious gathering and triggers a mass riot. And and the emperor, who at that time is going to be Tiberius, is like, okay, well, you're incompetent, so we'll bring in somebody else. But the Romans never find a somebody else that can manage the problem, in part because they're sending – like the Roman elites are all the same. Like right, there is right. no Roman elite who knows which way is up out There's here. There's no Lawrence of Arabia no. who can do the good imperial grunt work on the ground and get to know people. Um See, this is perfectly timed for the holiday season. We got we got Jesus, we got Hanukkah. It's all coming together. Um, and so I want to, because you have you have political views about the present moment as well, and I, I have an interesting way of segueing, which I'm, I'm I'm hoping will elicit the right response from you. Um, I know you occasionally listen to this podcast, and um, I've had Russell Moore on here a few times, who was this major Christian, uh, uh theological thinker. He's now a, at, at World Magazine, and he was the basically the head of doctrine at the S Southern Baptist Conference or whatever that's called. And um, really sweet, wonderful man. And 
Um, I don't like the game of spot the righteous Gentile, but he would hide me. And, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, but he tells a story, uh, which I've repeated a few times, which is that he gets reports from pastors at the lo- at, at various parish churches who say they'll quote straight up scripture, just just Jesus 101 about turn the other cheek and judge not lest you be judged. Well, that kind of stuff, right? The, the, the golden oldies. And um, people will come up to him afterwards and say, you really should keep that woke stuff out of your sermons. And the pastors will say, well, you know, I'm actually quoting literally like the Sermon on the Mount or whatever, you know, quoting Jesus, the red letters. And and he says, this would happen from time to time in the past, but the the response would be a little bit of embarrassment by the parishioner who would say, oh, I guess I got to think twice, bone up on my biblical literacy or whatever. And he says, in the era of Trump, the response is, yeah, well, that stuff worked back in a neutral culture when Jesus was around <laughs> and we don't live in a neutral culture anymore. And so that turn the other cheek golden rule stuff doesn't work. and. Again, I'm a weak T Jew. I know a decent amount about Christian history, the, about the New Testament. I did a documentary on the Cathedral of Notre Dame, so I had to do a lot of my sort of Passion of the Christ tutorial stuff. I'm pretty sure that Roman culture was not particularly neutral vis a vis Jesus or, frankly, the Jews. Um, yeah, no, neither. Mm. And, um, to me, it's very similar to this like reincarnation thing where if I went back in time, um, everything, I would be a general or something right. or a Caesar, right? It's like, if you go back in time, everything was hunky dory for the guy who was crucified You're right. <laughs> by the Romans, right? Yeah, so anyway, yeah. I'm just wondering what, what you think of all of that. Um, and, you know, I'll yeah, Rome was not, was not a neutral culture. Um, the Romans, um, when it came to Judaism, at least, the, the Romans found the religion confusing and confronting but they could at least admit that it was ancient and the Romans had a respect for things that were old. Um, you know, from the Roman perspective, if, if the Jews have been worshiping this God of theirs for a thousand years and they're still here, that's clearly a God that exists and has been helping them out and they should keep doing that. They should keep doing what they're doing um, and, you know, put, put in a good word for the emperor. Um, there is actually a point, it's in 250, where one of the emperors commands everybody in the empire to sacrifice for the health of the emperor and the empire. And there is a carve out for Jewish communities. And it's like, you can just pray to your weird God for the same things. Um, because he knows that they can't do it. Um, he does not put in a carve out for Christians. Um, and, and that kind of cuts to the sort of the Roman attitude. Christianity was not ancient. It was new. Uh, in fact, it it was a religion that proudly proclaimed it was following someone the Romans had gone through the time and trouble to execute. Um, and Tacitus is kind of baffled by this. Um, and so the Roman response was a lot more hostile. Now, it, it's very localized and varied for most of Roman history. Um, Roman authorities aren't generally like hunting down Christians. What will happen is that the emergence of a Christian community will create tensions in a city or a town and that city or town will then call in the Roman authorities and the Roman authorities will restore order by cracking down on the Christians. And that sort of basic cycle repeats in our sources um, over and over again. Um, and then of course, Christian communities respond unsurprisingly by going underground, at which point the Romans are like, we have a religious movement, a messianic religious movement that is hiding from us. And so they begin you know, cracking down even harder, they're getting, you know, more concerned. Um, systemic empire-wide persecution um, only really begins happening in the third century. Um, but sporadic persecution is is definitely a thing much earlier. Um, there's, we actually have uh, a letter, uh, a pair of letters in exchange between Pliny, um, who's a senior Roman senator, this is Pliny the Younger, and the emperor Trajan, where Pliny has been dispatched to Bithynia Pontus. Um, which is today would be northern Turkey, Turkey on the Black Sea. And he is for the first time running into Christians. Um, 
you know, this is in the early second century, so like the early 100s. It gives you a sense of how small a movement it was that like Pliny is getting out here to the east and he's like, who are these people? Um, but he runs into some of his communities have Christian communities and it's creating tensions um, because, you know, the locals are like, why don't you practice the traditional religion anymore? And the Christians are like, we don't do that anymore. And the locals are like, could you please, though? Um, and, and, and Pliny's response is to say, one, he won't take anonymous accusations. Two, anybody who's brought to him accused of being a Christian can get out of it by just asserting that they're not. But that three, if you're not willing to lie to him, he will execute you which is always like, this is the sort of the Roman response. It's a very zero or 100 sort of response where the, you know, the, and, and the tra Trajan's advice is literally, you're right not to take anonymous accusations because that leads nowhere good. Um, don't go seeking out the Christians, but if any are brought to you, like, you know, torture them to death. Um, <laughs> and you're just like, whoa. Um, that escalated quickly. <laughs> yeah, but um, so that's a sort of Roman response. But yeah, these are communities existing in hiding. This is not a neutral environment. Um, the Romans do not believe in freedom of speech in the imperial period um, or freedom of religion. And so, yeah, no, this is not a, a neutral environment. Um, and... And as you also note, obviously, you know, there are Jewish communities outside of Judea in the Roman Empire. They also face uh, headwinds not as strong as, as Christian communities do in this period because the Romans can recognize this is ancient. Right. But every time there's some damn flare up in Judea, the Roman authorities crack down on Jewish communities the empire wide. Um, you know, uh, it, it would have really sucked to have been Jewish in Rome. There was a significant Jewish community in the city of Rome in right. 66. Um, this is what Nero is doing. This is often remembered in the United States as Nero's persecution of the Christians. Mm -hmm. Nero understands himself to be cracking down on the Jewish community as a whole. And in the 60s, as far as the Romans are concerned, Christians are some weird offshoot of, of Jews. Right. So right. they get caught up in it. Um, but yeah, Nero is just – he's just doing some xenophobia that he has a problem with this province – there are people vaguely associated with that province where he is, so he's going to to do violence to them. Um, obviously, Nero not a not a standard bearer for good governance. Um, so three things: one, if you've never been to the Jewish quarter in Rome, try the fried artichokes; they're fantastic. Two, um, I do want to get to some Trump is Trump Caesar stuff before we. I, I have to let you go, um, and I never want to let you go, but. Um, I do have a weird question for you and um, you're free to punt on it. If you just don't have a good answer to your satisfaction, I'll be fine to mine. Um, one of the things I'm kind of fascinated by in political philosophy, which I know more about than ancient history is how bad the anthropology is for a lot of our most important political philosophers in the, the quasi modern period. Right. So like Rousseau's noble savage, I mean, he doesn't coin the phrase noble savage, but it's associated with him. There was no noble savage, right? Mm, he didn't no, live alone no. by himself in the woods no. and study poetry or anything no. like that, right? And the Hobbesian social contract, we've never found any place that had this contract, right? It's mm, That's no. not how it works. Even at a granting a certain level of metaphorical abstraction for it, it still doesn't actually work. And um, as anthropology, right, as, as like mm -hmm. understanding where human beings actually form from um, or sociology, I'm kind of curious – Nietzsche has this whole spiel that I think is psychologically insightful for the period that he's in to describe the world that he's in. But he starts it with this critique of Christianity as this slave morality where using resentment or resentment, uh, which is the pretentious French way of saying resentment, uh, the, um, the, the, what the Christians did is they took all of the things that the Romans considered to be virtues and turn them on the head and made them vices. And um, so uh, rather than strength and honor, meekness and turn the other cheek, right? It's like you go down this list of, of virtues that, that the Christ Christianity kind of slips flips on its head. And this is sort of where Nietzsche gets some of his Ubermensch stuff from is like, you need to reject this stuff. And I do think resentment in the Nietzschean sense explains a lot or illuminates part of a lot of contemporary cultural fights and tactics where you take the thing that the other side thinks is good and you declare it bad. Um, but I don't know 
how much actual explanatory power that has about the Christian relationship with the Romans. Was that actually a thing? You know, this sort of this, this argument that Nietzsche makes about priests flipping the script and saying knights are bad and, and life denying uh, meek turn the other cheek types are good. Uh, I get why Nietzsche German guy could see it that way, <laughs> but I, is, is there, do you think there's a sociology there or, a, or a, is there paperwork on this that you think bolsters it or is it? Yeah. I mean, of course the person you really need to get in here to answer this question is my friend, Nadia Williams, but, um, um broadly yeah i don't i don't think nietzsche's got this right um i think it's it's certainly the case that that christianity presents in the ancient world not even just to the romans a fairly radical morality but it, it certainly isn't rejecting the sort of entire social system across the board um you know in in that sense um and you know, we have a whole genre of Christian apologetics um, from the the second and third century where they're pretty adroit in sort of phrasing is like, yeah, no, we're demonstrating courage. Like you think courage is a virtue, like look at the courage that we are demonstrating and, and this sort of thing. Um, and, and in in some ways, um, you know, obviously it, it was a it was a moral system that had significant appeal to to the Romans. Christian theology also draws heavily on the philosophy of of the period. There is a lot of Plato and a lot of Stoicism um, scattered through 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 the Gospels and through the Pauline letters, um, and this sort of sense that like the greatest thing is the ability to endure, which comes out really clearly from Paul. That you know, like bad stuff happens and you just sort of take it. That's very stoic. And the Romans would have, would have, would have understood it. Um, nor of course is, is Christianity wholly rejecting Roman martial values. Um, that is striking that Jesus rejects the use of violence to protect his person, but at no point does he tell the centurion he's got to change jobs. Um, and so I think viewing, I think, I think it's accurate to say that this is a radical philosophy, but I don't think it's accurate to view it as a rejection of Roman morality in, in that same way. Okay, that, that's helpful. That's interesting. I mean, and, and at some point, Jesus does instruct his followers to carry swords, which, mm. you know, is relevant to the people who think that Christianity is radical pacifism in all things, which it's, it's not. Um, all right, so moving forward to the present day, you said something interesting to me the other day over DM when I was trying to cajole you on here. Um, about how uh, you thought I was a little too dismissive of the crowd that says, do you know what time it is, right? Which is this this part of the sort of new right. I don't want to call it conservative because I don't think it is. No, um, <laughs> it you know, is I mean, by definition, a conservative is someone who wants to maintain and preserve existing institutions, not hasten their demise. Right. So, uh, and... We're again. We're recording this on the middle uh, on December six, and uh, we've now seen the Atlantic, the Washington Post, the New York Times all do these sort of. This is the new conversation. Would Trump be a dictator? And um, and one of the points you made to me was that just because he wants retribution and personal settle his personal grievances, that's not an argument against him also becoming a dictator. Just look at Caesar. So why don't you make your point about that yeah so i i think some autocrats become autocrats because they plan to become autocrats but i think the the example of caesar is, is a good example of someone sort of almost backing themselves into this position um and caesar does this to himself all through his career caesar is a gambler um he takes big risks and because he's julius caesar they always pay off um you feel you feel sorry for his lieutenant, Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony, who tries to take all of the risks that Caesar takes and just it always fails. <laughs> You're like, ah, uh, it was a calculated risk, but Antony is bad at math. Um, but Caesar takes a series of political risks that kind of put him on the road to his dictatorship without it. It seems to me without clearly intending to. So. I mean, this starts in um, 
in 60 BC, he makes the decision. Um, the Senate is trying to clip his wings. Um, he's just had a, a very successful governorship. He can either have a triumph or he can stand for the consulship. And the, the assumption is you'll take the triumph and you'll wait until next year to run for the consulship. But Caesar, ever the gambler, drops the triumph and decides to run. And of course, that means he now must absolutely win. Um, that pushes him into a political alliance with Crassus and Pompey, the first triumvirate, which does get him into office. OK, Gamble checked out, but he's made promises for that alliance that he's going to push through laws they want that are not terribly popular. And so he breaks a lot of other laws to get their legislation passed. Um, so Gamble succeeded, but now his problem is that the moment he is out of office, he is going to be prosecuted. And he knows this. Now, in Roman law, as long as you have what's called imperium, the right to command armies as a result of your office, you are immune to prosecution. So Caesar is now locked into a strategy of he needs to always have a command. His allies help him out. They get him this long command in Gaul, initially five years, later extended to 10. Um, Caesar goes into Gaul, and he knows for his political survival, because if he ever exits office, he's going to be prosecuted. He needs a big success in Gaul. So he starts all sorts of wars. Um, the first one, he starts against a nominal Roman ally. He does not consult the Senate or the Roman voters about these wars. And so naturally, his political enemies in Rome, particularly Cato the Younger, um, are sitting there like, well, when you get back, we're going to prosecute you for illegally starting wars, which seems to be a big deal. So on the upshot, Caesar's popularity is increased. He becomes tremendously wealthy because of all of the loot, but he now really, really, really needs to retain a command forever. And that leads to the January crisis in 49, where Caesar's command is expiring. The Senate is not willing to renew it. And there's this sort of tense negotiation. Um, and in the end, Caesar decides to reopen the civil wars. So that gets us to the, the January crisis in 49. Um, Caesar's command is now expiring. He is desperate to get a command, any command somewhere. I mean, at one point, he's like a, one legion, and I don't care where it is. Um, but, um, you know, the, the political muscle in the Senate is just not there. In part, staying in command maintains his immunity, right? His he immunity, prosecuted right? He needs for all his sorts immunity. of bad stuff, yes. if not, right? And... And the argument he's making isn't even necessary. He's very popular. He might not be convicted in court, but being dragged through the courts would be an offense to his dignitas, his dignity. And he is not willing to take that personal insult. And it is on that basis that he crosses the Rubicon and plunges Rome into several decades of civil war. And I do want to stress to people because Caesar has a kind of warm, fuzzy glow sometimes in our discourse because all of the histories about Caesar were, were written under the system his grandnephew established in his name. And so if you're writing under Augustus, writing a highly critical biography about Julius Caesar is maybe not a great idea. Um, and so he gets this sort of warm glow. But the civil war that Caesar opens – by crossing the Rubicon is catastrophic. Um, almost, no, actually, yeah, almost no Roman of consequence, of any significance, at the beginning of this is alive by the end of it. Um, and you can actually get a sense for how bad it was, because even with Caesar as, as dictator in Rome, when he's assassinated, the people of Rome freak out because the last four years have been miserable and they're like the next 10 are going to be worse now like the 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 assassins expect people to come out and celebrate liberty and instead the populace of rome locks themselves in their houses and like hides in their basements um and they're right because the next 10 years of civil war are even worse than the last four um and so the sort of the first caution i would put on that is for some of the um, you know, new right, alt right idiots who are like, we need a Caesar. I'm like, you, you end up dead yeah. if we have a Caesar. <laughs> like, you, you don't, you, me, everybody, anybody who's going to be on a podcast is not making it out. <laughs> um, and, um, 
you know, so that's sort of like on the on the one end. But on the other end, it's striking to me how Caesar's personality. Um, uh, uh, I think it's it's Lucian who has the quip that um, that Caesar could tolerate no superior and Pompey no equal to describe the personality conflict between the two men. But that personality, more than a political program, more than a plan, is what leads to Caesar to collapse the republic. And I think we should be concerned here that, like, I, do I think that Donald Trump is sort of in the corner planning his rise to, like, Stalin-esque tyranny? No. Um, but that doesn't mean that a mix of, of sort of uh, pride, vengefulness, and ego and ambition couldn't lead him there anyway. It certainly has also for people in the Also, institutions that prevent yes. that stuff can lead to not preventing it, right? Right. Yeah. No, and I, you know. I'm I'm a big fan of it. I know we are we are fans of institutions on this podcast, <laughs> but uh, institutions are important. And so, yeah, I I count myself among the concerned here. Um, I think it would be I think it would be quite dangerous um, for Donald Trump to be let back into power. On that, we agree.